For the 23-24 season, Talking Wolves are proudly sponsored by Green King Sport, where football is more than a game. Green King Sport venues are shown every single one of Wolves' televised fixtures over the course of the season. So instead of turning to the internet for a dodgy stream, why not get together with your mates, go to a Green King Sport venue and get closer to the action. Now this season, Green King Sport have launched a Green King Sport Instagram page. It's home of the fan content, loads of giveaways and competitions on there. They've actually got a Champions League uh, final tickets giveaway on there at the minute. Uh, hopefully they're doing it next season because you might see Gary O'Neill's wolf side in that, the way things are going. But there's loads of other prizes on there, signed shirts and much more. So to make sure you're first to know about all the action over on the Green King Sport page, go and drop them a follow on their Instagram. And obviously you'll be helping us out here at Talking Wolves as well. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Talking Wolves podcast. I'm your host, Matt Cooper, and the squad is slowly getting back to full fitness. We've still got one major um, one major signing missing from the squad today, but welcome back, Jordan Russell. Jordan, how are you, mate? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, coming live from different location today or different setup? Or... No, it's a different setup. My, uh, I'm in between jobs at the moment, so I'm actually lapped up less until tomorrow. So I'm you're actually topless. Uh, topless. <laughs> That's not a great place for your internet to lag, mate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> laptopless. So uh, yeah, so I'm doing it off a phone. So it does look like I'm uh, I'm in a bunker basically, and this is like my plea to get me out. But I'm uh, no, I'm all good. I'm safe and sound, just in the loft. Yeah, when um, any women listening on Apple and Spotify, they heard I'm topless, so I'd be straight to the YouTube version, <laughs> mate. <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have been straight on there. What have you been up to, mate? It's, Feels like it's been a, it's been a while. It's what's yeah, been, been a while well, since I've seen you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had the charity game somewhere. as well. Charity game, yeah. I made some friends. Let's say or enemies, depends or who you enemies. ask. Probably, probably, you know, I don't think I've hit a football as hard in ten years in my life, but you know, I'll take it. You know, it was a great highlight, but I did try and take the keeper's head off. If I'm being honest with you, you um, and then, <laughs> Yeah, I nearly did succeed. Um, it's a shame, really. Um, and. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. It's obviously been nice, nice uh, few positive results for the Wolves as well, and it. So it's uh, I'm coming on to the pod to be really positive for a change, which uh, might be a bit of a shock to people, but yeah, I'm in good spirits. I can't lie. Oh Talking of positivity, Mr. Positive always, Mr. Glass half full. Dave has a party. <laughs> How are you, mate? Mr. I'm Happy very well, Clapper. boys. <laughs> I'm very well, boys. How are we? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. What's uh, what's new? Anything? I saw you on why Saturday we skip, I didn't know. Why we skipped over George Stag do that we weren't invited to, by the way? Because you weren't invited to it, so I couldn't oh, give a right, fuck. Okay. That's yeah. why. <laughs> I did listen back to the podcast. I told... I did, yeah, it's... Uh, you went with your dad, didn't yeah, you? <laughs> to answer that, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah me, my dad and Emma. That was it, yeah. yeah. No, I pressed <laughs> the button on the glass. Both sides. Um, and it was Emma behind uh, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, literally. Um, <laughs> nah. Like I say, it was a. Compl- I, was, I was saying to Dave at the LA Wolves thing. I found out literally that day. I think it was at the LA Wolves event because I put on LinkedIn I was leaving, and um, the chat was like, "Oh, looking forward to the stag," and I messaged him saying, "Stag question mark," <laughs> and then that was it. And then, my, then my best man called me and was like, "Yeah, by yeah, we're going on your stag next week." I was like, "Great." So I got. I can explain it all properly, but he's a. Uh, He's, he's having his first kid in December, so he's all along he's been saying, "Well, he's, the story's been we'll wait until the new year and we'll sort it out." And I was like, "Okay, no worries, not a problem," because you know I thought he's got a lot on his plate with his first kid and whatever. And then him and Emma have sorted it behind my back and stuff. So I do apologise you weren't invited to it, but the plan was it would be in January and you were going to be invited, obviously, oh. and you're obviously invited to uh, a homestay we're having. Oh. Uh, well, and you can try and yeah, you can come to Antigua. You want to play? Want. You get you want. <laughs> but no, definitely the party and stuff back here as well. So no, yeah, yeah I do. Uh, I haven't spoken to Matt about it properly yet, but I want to wholeheartedly apologise, Matt. It was out of my hands. I apologise, and I'm sorry. Dave, it sounds like he's he's nailed this cover up. Like like he's got he's had a week to meticulous detail, isn't it? Uh, yeah. load, load, load of me, me, me and Dave spoke about it like a it's like a latest me and Wolvo. I was like, well, it's just all been thrown on. I thought I was going on a romantic break to wherever with Emma for a belated birthday present, and then yeah, ended up in Amsterdam and ended up to no good. 
I've, I've never actually been to Amsterdam. I've been, it's all right. That's good. Oh, I'm glad you had a good time. Thanks, Joe. I would, you know, I would, I would, I would have liked to come. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll I, 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 we'll stay if you want. Mate. Uh, you ain't voted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I hold you in very high regard. I think a lot of you. And I was a little, I was a little bit disappointed. I can't, I, I, I can't. I thought it was, I thought Dave was on the wind up. Um, <laughs> but you know, you, you soon learn who your mates are. But at le- least we can come to the wedding, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Coming yeah. to the wedding, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When's the wedding again? Twenty seventh February. Uh, have you sent the invites out yet? Uh, no, it's in Antigua. We ain't gonna go to Antigua, Dave. Da- Dave, uh, you don't know, Green King might send us. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then the party's back uh, back home in Bridge North, and it's that's a lot more local. So, Gosh, we'll be there, yeah, we'll be yeah. there, mate. We'll be there. Well, did you have a good time? Now, that's the most important thing. I enjoyed 85% of it. I actually say, yeah, I loved 85% of it, and then uh, 15% of it was just not with fun. his dad. <laughs> just, to, okay, just, just to clarify, my dad did not come. That was, you know, he did all over your face. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh my god! Um, for anyone listening, there, there was the weekend that George was in Amsterdam. There was a there was a viral story doing around <laughs> around glory hole activity, and you probably heard oh, it between a daughter and a, a father. Um, so. There was a vicious rumor that this was George involved because it was a stag do and it was in Amsterdam. Um, but yeah, George, can you confirm or deny whether that was you? Well, I can confirm it was not me. And to my knowledge, my dad and Emma were in Star- the Starbridge region that day. And to my knowledge, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't think there's any glory holes in Starbridge. <laughs> Let's not let's not think about it actually because it's probably not a thought that you want to be, and it's probably not a thought that the listeners want to be um, here. Well, they may do, but anyway, um, Dave. Yeah. Uh, oh, me and you went for a few beers on Saturday night, didn't we? We had it. I had a few, and then they went home and had a Mackie to watch a Fury fight. But what time did you um did you get home? Uh, I got home about five a.m. Oh my god! <laughs> what time was the plasterer coming? Uh, <laughs> Plaster came to the new house half eight. Oh, it was not good. So I got home, was asleep to about two yesterday. And all yesterday was I felt really worse aware. Had um had a grill it though. I've actually had a grill it for tonight as well. I've had two grillets on the bounce. So um it's again, Nanic sponsor, if they're if they're listening. But yeah, I had a grill it pizza yesterday, a grill it chicken wrap tonight. So yeah. Bash. And um, did you, I know we spoke about it on the last podcast, but I think what everyone wants to know is, did you find yourself a cougar? Uh, <laughs> not a cougar, no. Oh! 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 Let's talk about the football. I don't really want to. I'd love to hear more about this story, but I'm sure we can um, we can save that for the, the Patreon if ever we launch one. Um, <laughs> Wolves to Newcastle to Jord, and probably the most obvious scoreline from the uh, from when the fixtures were released at the start of the season because it always ends up this way. Yeah, but they're usually quite a drab affairs at Molyneux as well, and it was anything but a drab affair, to be honest with you. I thought um, it was two good footballing teams. I thought it was two good sides. Um Went went for it, hammer and tongue, and you know what? I think I think it was a fair result as well. I know we'll go into the controversy of maybe a couple of the officiating decisions um, again, like we always seem to have to talk about on this podcast. Um, but I just thought it was a well fought, good game of football, and uh, yeah, cre- credit where credit's due. You know, I thought um, we played really well again. Five unbeaten now, so it's uh, onwards and upwards from there, really. Dave, what were your initial thoughts on the uh, the performance? It's Molyneux becoming somewhat of a, a, a fortress, isn't it? The atmosphere seems to be coming back, and uh, it's actually quite a tough place for teams to go for for what feels like quite a long time. Yeah, no, I thought it was a you know cracking game of football. Um, I did think you know I felt the atmosphere was great, and at the end of the game, I thought as a neutral, this would have been a really good game to watch. I felt so, but to go pretty much toe to toe. Over the last few weeks, we have three teams in City, Villa and Newcastle that are in European competition. I think it just shows how far Wolves have come in, in such a short period of time. I think it was just 
five weeks ago when we lost to Ipswich and people were like, oh, this Gary O'Neill, I just don't think it's the right decision. So things have very, very quickly changed. Um, but then it's sort of games like next week against Sheffield United where really they're the games that we've got to be winning. But it's great, obviously great to get another positive result really at the weekend and a really good game of football. Yeah, I think it's a, a slight anomaly, Joel, because Newcastle have got some some big players out. Um, but you can, see, you know, there's still it's still a good side. What Eddie Howe's done there, he's, he's done a, he's done a cracking job. I know they've spent quite a lot of money, but I thought, George, we, we've more than matched them, and probably the probably the better side. Um, and I think if you'd have looked at this game on paper for four or five weeks ago, you'd have been absolutely dreading it. 100%, yeah. I think, like I say, f- football's a very weird and wonderful sport and momentum's a big thing. And Like I say, after that Ipswich result, if we'd have been playing Newcastle home after that, you'd think we'd get a tonking. Um, but you're right, look, they've, they've got a few injuries at the moment. Um, you could say they're a little bit jaded um, from the from the exerts of uh, Dortmund in midweek, but I thought second half, we looked like the only team really going to go on and win the game. Um, I thought they, I thought Newcastle started the game quite strongly that first sort of 20 minutes or so, playing through our lines, uh, picking up balls in sort of like the half space in between the midfield and defence. And then Gary O'Neill changed it a little bit in terms of, it seemed to be like, I think it was um, Joe Linton kept getting acres of space and, and Almer on um, inside, but then he got the centre halves and to follow in the runners as well and sort of close that space. So, in game, it was, you know, you could see he made those sort of tactical changes, but um, yeah, look, look, it was. I thought it was a real good, solid point, and um, you would have took that before the game. Um, mm. And I think we're just building something nice, you know. It seems like the, the atmosphere is back. Come right, like the fans are on side. Um, it was great to have Molyneux under the lights again, and it just seems like we we saw sort of getting back to dare I say a bit of like the Nuno-esque when we first come up, it feels like we can take anyone on at the moment. And, uh, you know, it, it's great. That's what, that's what we're about and that's what we want to see. Yeah, that, it was even like a couple of new chants going, weren't there? I know there was, some fans were singing, it's magic, you know, can you hang in it? Oh, which yeah. I quite like, but it, it feels like forever that there's been like a new chant for somebody. Um, but George, right there, the Wolves faithful starting to... Um, be loud and proud again, and even even without the contentious decisions, it seems that the atmosphere. I know it helps that everyone was probably pissed up before. Um, he's he, he's starting to come back at Molyneux, but the, the the goal that we first conceded, Dave, it's, I know, and I know George Toby would have taken a point, but looking at the circumstances in the game, that sloppy goal to concede the penalty. That's not the penalty. Probably, you know, should have come away with three points. But that first goal, do you, do you think it's a foul, Dave, on Sarah, or do you think he needs to do better? I've not really watched it back, the, the first goal, if I'm honest. I think, obviously, all the uh, attention's been sort of on the penalty. But I felt at the time, I felt almost like the play, <clears throat> the players stopped because I think they were half expecting a whistle. I think we mentioned it on the reaction that goalkeepers are very protected normally by referees. Um, but, yeah, I think if Saar comes for that, he's got to he's, he's got to hold on to it. Um, and then, obviously, sort of Wilson puts it in the end. So... I was half expecting VAR to sort of overturn it as well, but obviously nothing fell for us in terms of officiating. Nothing really fell for us in that in that game. So yeah, I think it's more poor goalkeeping really by Saar. Yeah, we we say that that goalkeepers are probably a little bit too overprotected, George. But if you if you if you know you're not going to get there or you can get there and you're not confident of catching it, he's got to punch it or at least par- parry it away from danger. 100%. I said it on the fans, that's like, it's just weak goalkeeping for me. Like, you've got a goalkeeper, all the good goalkeepers come out and they just take everything in front of them. Wolves players, Newcastle players. And you know what? You'll ca- you catch the ball, you take them all out and you know what? You'll probably get a foul because, like you say, the goalkeepers are overprotected in this league. Um, he's, he's gone to try and sort of claim the ball with his arms stretched out. So as soon as there's any contact on his elbows, the ball's just popped out. And um, you can't give Callum Wilson chances like that in the box. I mean, he's still. I think he still took it extremely well. I watched it back, and I think he's actually took it. It's a harder chance than you think. Like sort of a, almost like a side bicycle kick or whatever you want to say. It was. It wasn't quite an overhead kick, but um, yeah, I think you know for all Sars qualities, um, his shot stopping, um, he's still got that rick in him, which is you know I know me and you Matt have said it a few times on here, like not his biggest fans, but um, yeah, he needs to cut that out big time because it do, he will cost us points 
going through the season as well. You know he's got one of them in him, probably one every four or five games, to be honest. Mm, I think um, Gary O'Neill has, has said this about a few players, actually, where try and control those moments of madness and try and just be a little bit more consistent with what they're doing in the decision making. He said it about Saar, he said it about Eight Nori, he said it about the back two as well, Dave. It's a shame, really, because I think in the last few weeks, Saar's been 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 improved. Has improved. That's awful English. Yeah. Has improved. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And I think, again, that's one mistake. I, I, it's hard as a goalkeeper because a player or a midfielder can make six or seven mistakes throughout a game and not get punished. But obviously, as a, as a goalkeeper, you make one mistake and it's more than likely going to end up with the ball in the back of the net. So, yeah, I think, you know, he's not been he's not been awful this season. He's had a couple of great games. You know, the, the away win at Everton, I thought he was fantastic in. Manchester City, you know, their only goal came from, you know, a set piece. So, he didn't concede an open play there. Um, so, look, he, he's not he's not been awful, but we've just got to obviously iron out these sort of individual errors. Um, and it's frustrating, but again, the, the rest of the game, you know, he did what he needed to do, really. Yeah, it wasn't long after that that Wolves went up the other end, Jordan. Scored direct from a corner, which Eddie Howe will probably be fuming with considering the size of their back four and Joe, <laughs> Joe Linton in the middle. But Lamina getting on the score sheet for the first time in a Wolves shirt and it looked like it meant the world to him. But another assist for Neto, probably his last for a, for a short while as well, frustratingly. I'll come to you, Dave. So he's, <laughs> he's having some technical difficulties. But um, yeah, it, it, it looked like it meant the world to him. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realise it was his first goal, to be fair, in a, in a, in a Wolves shirt. And... I feel I can't remember the last time we scored directly for corner either. Um, it's not. It's not very often that teams do. No. So yeah. To be fair, Neto had, there was a few set pieces, wasn't there, where it was a little bit. Um, I don't know. They were a little bit short. Almost. It was like Jean Martini was back on the corners again. But <laughs> that one was perfect. You know, right because you know, right in the middle of the area. Um, and thankfully, it's found Lamina. It's a great header as well. But yeah, nice for Neto obviously to get another assist, and obviously great to see Lamina on the score sheet as well. Yeah, I thought when Tommy Doyle come on, though, some of his deliveries were... He, can, he can't half whip a ball in, I tell you. Um, another yeah. another impressive performance from him. But um, let's talk about that decision. Um, I, I still cannot believe that they took that long to look at it on, on VAR and still give the incorrect decision. Um I had the luxury of actually watching it on the telly because I'd gone down at like 40 to get a beer and it showed it on the screen. Um, and I was like, oh, I can't believe they've given that man. That, that's a joke. I'll overturn that. And the longer it went on, I thought they're going to give this. But Dave, it's just how many, how many times are we going to have this conversation and how many times are we going to get an apology for it? It's a, it's an absolute shambles. I was, I was, um, I wasn't surprised when he gave it initially because obviously he was sort of South Bank in and I thought... Yeah, I get why he's giving it in. I on thought Wang had, had cocked it up, really. I thought he's got to... I think his first touch wasn't great. He's got to clear it a lot sooner. And obviously, as he swung, players gone gone down. But it, it took Anthony Taylor, you know, a few seconds before he, he put his uh, lips to the whistle. Um, but the players seemed adamant that, you know, it shouldn't have been a penalty. And obviously, when it goes to VAR, and I think the longer that went on, and I thought, well... It's obviously not as clear as you know the the referee thought, um, but really this is the blame of the VAR. I know Anthony Taylor got you know he didn't have a fantastic game, I don't think. But if in his mind, if he thinks it's a penalty, then yeah, it's a penalty. But then it, that, that's the job of the VAR to say actually, Anthony, I think you've got this wrong. Do you want to go and have a look at it and and just sort of put everyone's mind at rest that you know you agree with our, our decision? So the fact that it stood, I don't know, was it Jared Gillett on VAR? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no surprise there again. So uh, it, it's um, frustrated. And then you see all these sort of referee support pages. Well, what happens when all these players that make mistakes that cost their teams the game? And I said, well, that's one thing. But a goalkeeper doesn't get a chance to replay and make a save again. Whereas a referee, if he makes a mistake, he can go and correct it. Um, so that's it's a load of rubbish, really. So frustrating. Two twice there, you know where. Things just haven't quite gone our way. Obviously, the SAR incident, um, and, and then obviously this. And I think that's the third time now where you know we had the United game where we should have probably got something. Obviously, this game, there's another one I'm I'm forgetting as well. Um, 
Luton in it, as they're talking about. Yeah, the, the Luton game as well. You know, these are, I know, it's not how football, you know, the, the game will change massively compared, you know, with, with whatever happens in these incidents. But Wolves genuinely could be three or four points better off than, than where they are at the moment. Yeah, someone um, someone had put that in one of the questions. I'd actually worked it out, but I mean, even at the other end, the um, the handball they checked, but neither neither are penalties. But George, how how on earth can they look at that and not deem it clear and obvious? Because Wang's the, the contact's initiated by Shah. Wang kicks the ball with his left foot. He stops, and Shah kicks him in the back of the leg. And for some reason, it, it's a penalty. It's just it's just pathetic. Oh, God. I I feel like I just break refs on here, and uh, I don't like <laughs> doing it. To be honest with you, but they are fucking awful, and um, nothing changes. Nothing changes, and um, I agree with what you said, Dave. Like Anthony Taylor, I mean, I was in the Billy Wright up uh, as soon as it happened in, in real time. You just think, oh, it's it's a penalty, but you're, I'm, you're miles away. You ain't got a clue, really. Um, my phone was going off like mad in the ground um, from people watching it at home. Albion fans, Albion fans who are friends of mine and stuff, saying this is getting overturned. And the fact it went on for three, four minutes, I was like, well, let's, I was went with my dad and I said, oh, it's going to get overturned here from what I'm being told. Um, obviously, it didn't. And it was only when I got home I actually watched it. And this is what I don't get with it, like VAR, because then you've got the, the the on the flip of it, you got the decision in the Manchester derby yesterday, which. I, it, that happens probably at, probably every every set piece. There's a pull back in the box. Yeah, and they're, they're getting involved in that, saying that's clear and obvious. I like I don't know what the threshold is anymore. I, it, it just it, it really pisses me off. And again, like I get annoyed with people saying, "Oh, the Premier League's corrupt. It's this, it's that." Because I want to believe that the game is quite pure, and you know the best team wins on the day and stuff. But I'm finding it hard now in terms of I do think there's an unconscious bias to these bigger sides. But there's no possible way that Jared Gillett has looked at that. I, I don't understand how it's up three, four minutes. They've looked at it in the VAR uh, booth, shed, whatever, the, whatever they call it. <laughs> shed. <laughs> shed, whatever. You know. And, and, and the, 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 um, they've still deemed, oh, it's not clear and obvious to get involved. I'm sure, in fact, if they, all that to say was to Anthony Taylor, we, we think we should just go and have a look at it. Just have a look at it. Anthony Taylor would not give that. If he watched that replay himself, he would not give that penalty because he thinks that Quang's kicked through the back of Shaw like yeah, a lot yeah. of people on the ground did in real time. In fact, he hasn't. He would have reversed the decision. I know he would have. But what happened from that point though then is Anthony Taylor completely lost the game. Like he was a shambles for about thirty minutes after that. It, it, both teams I thought he was bad for. I thought he was getting decisions wrong. He was listening to the crowd. Um, there was a few Newcastle bookings where I don't really think there were bookings, but there was a few that got away with which should have been bookings, and it was just like it, I don't know what, like you know, it, 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 the officiating in the Premier League is just so bad for the for the best product in the world. It, the officiating is awful. The booking yeah. shouts, especially in the second half, there was one where Cunha broke through, and I think it was Joe Linton pulled him back, mm. and then he yeah. played the advantage. Um, and, and the move broke down. And when the game stopped, he didn't give a book in. And for, that's like the most clear yellow card of the game. Dan Byrne got away with two or three before he's booking as well. So it's just that, and that, that happens every game the lack of consistency from, from the referees in terms of the bookings and stuff like that. I think the only one that I've seen sort of stick with it was uh, Michael Oliver at Brighton right at the start of the season. I think it was Michael Oliver when Nunes got sent off as well. Um, yeah. But other than that, it's just like, yeah, just even when in the game I'm talking to you, but if someone's on the counter-attack, you're being pulled back. Like, that's just the most clear and obvious yellow card all game. Trippy had about um, seven or eight um, fouls yeah, as well. His tackle was poor as well. I think it was on eight and all, the, yeah. the one he got the booking for. tackle, yeah. 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 So, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a shambles, isn't it? And then you get the ref support and all these um, fucking yeah. morons on Twitter. And you know what? It's it's not a job that I'd want to do, and and especially at like lower league levels, they must be like uh, uh, exposed to some levels of shit from dickhead parents who can't control themselves. But it's almost like a us versus them now, and it's just it's like so petulant. Whereas if you got the decision right in the first place, you wouldn't need to make it all about you. You're there to referee the game. So frustrating, and they all they all say, "Well, have we ever?" 
Uh, what, what happens if a, if, a, if a player makes a mistake? They're not held accountable. If a manager makes a mistake, well, they do post match interviews where they get yeah. where they get quizzed yeah. on it more often than not. So why 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 should that be any different? But it, it just it winds well, me up. The thing that I don't get is, and again, I think it's such a simple thing to do, is like, I mean, you, again, like I don't like really drawing parallels between different sports. I know it's different, but like rugby union, cricket, NFL. Like the referees are like wired up to the stadiums, and when they do like vid- like VAR or booth reviews or whatever, they're actually talking through the decision as it's happening. So you might not actually agree with the decision, but you're actually hearing the rationale of why they got you're to that decision. You. Yeah, and yeah. You yeah. Can sort of go, you know, what you don't agree, you don't have to agree with everything, but if you understand why they've done it, okay, you go well, okay, fair enough. You know, Anthony Taylor would have said, "Huang's kick through Shaw." And then they could have stopped him just just had an honest conversation. Like, you know, and I don't know how you do it, but other sports do it. And again, we talk about football here, like the most played sport or most watched sport in the world, Premier League, the most watched league in the world. Why can't you just do it like that? I don't understand why you can't just talk through decisions. It's not it's not the technology that's say. wrong though. Like for me, VAR works. It's just the morons are in charge of it. And you're never gonna eliminate human error. But the technology's there to assist you. So so, so use it. So obviously, obviously, just don't know. I've never played football before because you look at that, and and we not, not play to any great level, but we know that's not a penalty. So how can they take four or five minutes to look at it and then come to the decision that it is a penalty? It's just VAR works. Just the people in charge of it. But sick of talking about it. I know Gary O'Neill said something in his post-match press conference about I'm not going to give it my energy until they improve, which yeah. upset a load of referees on Twitter. But <laughs> that doesn't take much. But uh, Dave, do you want to talk about Totti Gomez slander and why it should no longer exist? <laughs> Man, I never ever want to hear his technical ability abused or you know on this podcast. I said it since I was going to say day one, but I said it's last season when all of you said he was a crap footballer. He's... And now look, now, <laughs> mate, <laughs> I don't think anyone else on our team would have been able to do what he did there on Saturday. We did. They would. No. <laughs> I reckon Scott would have probably had to go at that. No, to Tom be fair, look, the, the turn from him was, you know, I think he's brave from a centre half to to try. You know, a lot of them, especially well, in those sort of forward areas, they just want to like almost like hot potato. Let's pass it over to someone who's probably a little bit better on the ball than me. But he showed quality there, and then used obviously his body to sort of get the better of the defender. Smart little ball through, but obviously Huang still got a lot to do. And again, the the issue with Hang, Huang sometimes is that. He always likes to have like that extra touch in front of goal. He did it a couple mm. of times, I think, against Bournemouth. First half as well. He, yeah, where he almost tried to shift it onto his other foot, but that was brilliant. He sent Dan Burn to to the Asda onto his left foot, and you know, if you've got Huang versus a goalkeeper, you know Huang's nine times out of ten going to put it in the back of the net, and that's what he did. And I thought, like I said, I said on the review, I thought he had a quiet game in the first half, a little bit frustrating, struggled to get into the game a little bit more. But if you've got players like him in your squad that can just create and, and grab a goal out of pretty much nothing, then brilliant. And, you know, his goal scoring record already this season is phenomenal. So long may it continue, but brilliant. The atmosphere, I think we used one of the pictures for the, the tweet today, but some of the pictures of that move were, were class. You could just about see me in the top left of the, the one where he turns Dan Byrne as well. So, um, no, nah, fantastic goal. Really good goal. I think... Um... I think Tossi's probably seen the two players coming across too and thinks, if I just get my body in the way here, they're going to get absolutely nowhere near me. He's so strong though, isn't he? Yeah. Um, I don't want to make it all about pace and power, but they like are his, they are his main attributes. Um, and it's a lovely little ball through, but like you said, Dave Wang, it looks like he's going to take it on his right. Dan Byrne ends up like, you know the shooting stars mean? The do, yeah. do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Goes absolutely flying with his hands up in the air. And it's... Uh, it's a it's a lovely finish, George. But he's banging form. Would you like again? Would you would you want to extend your apologies? Because I know <laughs> the, the slander. You said Wang's Wang's had a first touch of a not very nice human, <laughs> and that first touch there was I, exemplary. I, I don't think I said that. It was bleeped out. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe. However, however <laughs> um, no. Like I said, I've said it again a few times since. Like I think since the World Cup, he's been unbelievable. Like. Arguably our best player, I think. I mean, obviously, you know, from January, longevity yeah, yeah. January to, you know, to now. I know Neto's been unbelievable this season. Um, but as soon as he cut inside, I mean, yeah, it's an unbelievable finish. The composure, 
it's very reminiscent of the, um, when he sent Van Dijk for a hot dog when he's playing at Salzburg in the Champions League and just, yeah. you know, just literally shift, bang. It's all one motion. I think when he's got to think about it, and again, when he went with the penalty, inverted commas, the penalty, he was thinking about what he was doing and he just sort of stopped. When he's playing on instinct, he's mm. he's so, so good. Uh, he's as prolific as Dave has a party in Grain Store on a Saturday night. That's what we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> if only it was Grain Store, mate. No. Where was Cinderella's. it? Cinderella's. Mate, uh, nah. don't go. You got to <laughs> Guess. I'll give you three guesses. Um, <laughs> dive well, bar. I've, I've told you, mate. I think, and I. You, nah, you haven't. Well, dive uh, bar. What, um, in Walls. Probably the one place in Walls you would never expect to see me. See you? Yeah. Chicago's. No, that's, that's shut. Keep it down there. That's shut. Uh, Pop world, nah, the little the other one. What planet? <laughs> planet. <laughs> you listen yeah. to the scores. <laughs> get, get, got my CEX license. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight could be the night that I will fall for uh, you. <laughs> what did you end up in there for? Grand store was ticketed event, so yeah, prolific mate. What is I take it planets like a it is a bit of a rocker rock like yeah. <laughs> I bet you felt so out of place <laughs> in there. Yeah. <laughs> I had someone called to me. I, was, I saw this lad from school, genuinely I'm not seen in over 10 years. And he goes, Oh, he goes, What are you doing here? He goes, You do all the wall stuff now, don't you? I was like, Yeah, and just walked off. And someone else was like, I know you. Don't you do the videos? Why the hell are you here? It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> don't you do the videos? Yeah. <laughs> oh god. The only I mean, the only sauna apart from the penalty decision was the Neto injury, Dave. And we just can't have nice things as Wolves fans, can we? <laughs> um, as soon as he pulled up on hamstring, I think you said it was almost like a FIFA one where you're running for a goal and the player pulls up like the shot. But as soon as he did it, every Wolves player was stood there with his hands on his head and the, the old stadium went silent. It's, it's a huge blow. Uh, he said he'd be a couple of weeks. He's since edited that post to say a few weeks, but oh it's not looking good, is it, Dave? <laughs> No, um, I've just seen Tom Colomossi from the Mail as well say, oh, he may be back for Christmas. I was like, oh, what's going on Which here? Which Christmas? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, if he can be back by, you know, the other side of the international break, then great. But obviously it might be sort of, you know, early December. But it, it's obviously frustrating. You know, Wolves had a really promising counter like, attack going on as well when, when the injury happened. I will be interested to see who steps up. I know we we'll, we'll probably, you know, we'll have talk about it in a second uh, when we do the Sheffield United preview but be interested to see who steps up or if Gary O'Neill has to change things around slightly um, but yeah he'll be a huge miss you know the way his creativity the way he can he's been able to grab the game by the scruff of the neck Luton perfect example I thought he did the same against Bournemouth at times as well um, so yeah it'll be a, a, a huge miss really mm. um, before we move on to the uh, the Sheffield United preview uh, referee rating, George, out of 10? Um, two. What, what? Why did you... Why not a one? I think he was all right for about 20 minutes in the first half because he let the game go. I'm trying to be... I'm trying to be as... Point for every as possible. Yeah. Uh, but then to be honest, though, yeah. like the penalty decision, I can see why he's giving it, but it's not his fault That's that what I'm saying, good. yeah. It's yeah, his, I, his mates at Stockley Park. Yeah, it's his mates at Stockley Park. No shock, it's fucking Jared Gillett, the, the Aussie. He ain't got a fucking clue about football again. Um, not <laughs> helping out. Um, but no, like, I just think after that incident, he lost the game. Um, and, you know, Anthony Taylor is meant to be one of the elite referees in England. He goes and does the European games. And again, just, just terrible, awful, awful official. Roma fans don't like him, did I? Yeah. Had Wolves at least. Yeah. Um, Dave, referee rating? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with a two as well. Just one thing I want to I want to touch upon, lads, and uh, only very quickly, and it's been drawn to my attention the last two home games, is where I am in the North Bank, there's a there's about three blokes who stand right, right to the barrier on the right-hand side, and they're all like in a row. And if you've ever been to Molyneux around that area over the last 20, 25 years, You'll know I'm about that they're, they're always up standing, they've always got the tops off, they're always trying to create an atmosphere. I used to sit in WL9 as a nipper, and they were there then in the old North Bank. And 
They don't cause anyone any problems. Uh, they try and get the atmosphere going. They're constantly singing, which I think we need more of. Um, but the last two games, I've noticed that stewards and security officers have tried to eject them uh, from the stadium or threaten e- ejections, ejections, um, and and bans. <laughs> um, their their argument is that it's not safe standing. If they want to go and safe standing, they need to go into the South Bank. Then you've got three thousand Geordies in the steep ball. It's arguably a less safe stand to standing or standing up. So. I just think with stuff like that, common sense needs to prevail. If they're standing up in front of people um, and they're blocking the view, I get it, it's annoying. But they're, they're literally, from from what I can see, they're not standing up in front of anyone because they're literally right on the, the seats at the side. They're not blocking any, anyone's view. I just think sometimes just have a bit of common sense. I know some. I put it on Twitter and some people have said, good, they're annoying, they're too loud. I was like, what? Too loud. How can you you know, trying to trying to drum up a bit of atmosphere? They they literally sing their hearts out all game. They have the tops off, which you know it's not great to look at, I must admit. <laughs> um, which they won't want me saying, but I just think sometimes just a bit of common sense. I don't you, it's 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 hard, isn't it? I, I agree, I agree with you. Um but if there is an issue where I don't know what, what what the issue can be. I don't know if it's not safe standing, like what can happen? They all tumble over each other. Yeah. And... But so isn't, the, it... isn't the um? It, sorry, Dave. I was going to say the quadrant mm. in the North Bank's safe standing, isn't it? From yeah. my, from memory. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've got. Do you know, I think it's jobs worth being jobs worth, isn't it? Ultimately. Yeah, and like I, I get that they're just trying to do the job, but. They've been there. They've been there for year, like years, and it's never been a problem, unless someone behind said, "Look, I can't see." Which, if, if that's the case, fair enough. But I don't think they have. And like I said, they're right to the side, so and they all stand like one behind each other. You're still able to see, and the North Bank's that far over to the right hand side of the pitch. Even if you had yeah. someone in front of you, and you're not you're not looking that way. Um, I don't know. I just think it's. I just think it's a bit poor. Supported that club for for a long time, and they do the best to try and get the atmosphere going and. Even the last couple of seasons when it's been dire, they've been singing their hearts out. So mm. you've got people smoking in the bogs, in the toilets and stuff. And again, whatever people want to do, I don't care. But then to do stuff like that, it's, I think it's an easy kind of thing to in, in, enforce, isn't it? I, I've had I've had incidents involved where uh, I've been smacked in the face in, in the North Bank by someone sat in front of me and stewards didn't want to do anything. Um, there were no retrospective action. So... I just think it's a bit shit. I just wanted to get it off my chest and hopefully they don't get bothered anymore. If someone from the club's listening or no, they do, just, you know, use a bit of common sense, please. No, not harming anyone. Um, but Sheffield United, Wolves, I won't be making the trip. I've not done an away game this season. Plastic, just, mate. Uh, proper plastic. <laughs> do we not do an home game? <laughs> <laughs> unless, Bud- unless Budweiser have paid for it. <laughs> Budweiser looked after me so far. To Budweiser fair. season ticket. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I've not done an away. I ain't going to be able to go to a game for like six weeks. I'm having my need on Monday. So I'll have to get to one in the, in the, um, the new year. But Dave, Sheffield United, with what point? One point on the board. Um, cocktail sticks got more points than Sheffield United. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> yeah. really um, but it's a. It's not a must win in terms of Wolves need to where Wolves are at, but if they don't win this summit, summit, these are the teams you need to be beating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We need we need the three points. Um, put us in a great position in the league. But yeah, they've been they've been awful. You've not really heard much talk about unless I miss it about Hickenbottom losing his job. The last week like, or so that meant to be under pressure, but I think they've said they're going to stick with him. They've obviously priced relegation into the thinking, though, haven't they? Because sold the best players. Not sp- yeah. barely bent, barely spent any money. Barely bent, yeah. Barely bent. Um, <laughs> one point. I mean, they're they're five points adrift already. You know, they're in an awful position and conceding a lot of goals. Um, I, I, I hope you know. You'd hope away. Look, no game away from home in the Premier League is easy, and obviously they're desperate to to win a you know win a football match or at least get something out of the match. But you know, lost. You know. Nine games of football out of ten. You'd hope we've got the quality that we can, uh, you know, break them down and hopefully get a three points, which you know for us will be fantastic. You know, go possibly moving to the top half with three points, which would be great. George, what would you do in terms of formation? Would you stick with a five at the back? It seems to be working for us at the minute, but O'Neill's got yeah. a bit of a selection headache now, hasn't he? With Neto <clears> out, 
I know there's going to be clamours to go to a four because you'd be like, why do you need five at the back against uh, a team who've got one point in the league? But it's all that system and how you set up and, and your intent of how you play in that system. We're far more comfortable in the back five. I would not I would not move that back five. Um, you know, I'd obviously just push the wing backs higher up, potentially. Um I'm a bit nervous about the game, if I'm honest with you. I think these are the games that we're struggling and will struggle in this season as well. Um, Luton being another one. I know we didn't really turn up um, at all, really, in that game. But when when we're expected to win and we're expected to go and be on the front foot and break teams down, we know we, know we haven't really got those sort of... Well, we haven't really seen it that much in recent years that we can do that and break teams down. Um, for me, I'd be starting Tommy Doyle because I think we're going to have a lot of the ball. And for me, I thought he was unbelievable again. Second half when he came on against Newcastle, yeah, like playing for the Lions. He's, you can tell he plays. You can tell he's like grown up in the Man City academy. I think he looks like an unbelievable, unbelievably technically gifted footballer. Um, so definitely play Tommy, Bo- Tommy Boyle, Tommy Doyle. Um, it would be interesting to see what he does for Neto because I think there'll be clamours for Clydesic from the off. Um, for me, I'd go Belgard if he's fit. Um, I don't think that. Clydesich still has 90 in him. I'm not saying he would play 90, but I think O'Neill sees him as, you know, he's still come back from his ACL. Um, and he's not as, you know, we almost lose that dynamism with, that, with playing Clydesich because he's not as mobile as Cunyaneto and Huang. And Belgard is. So I think without rocking the boat too much, I think that's the obvious change. And I think there's, I think there's an argument for Sarabri as well, which I know would be unpopular. But again, if we're dominating the ball... He can get the ball in the half spaces, but again, you're losing that sort of dynamism of the front three a little bit if you bring him in. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just stick with the five and uh, maybe make one or two changes. Yeah, I think um, I think if you're gonna if with Neto out the side, you can't put Kolarovic in there. So at the at the um, the weekend, I know it was fairly late on in the game, and the injury did take the stuffing out of us. But I thought bringing Kolarovic on just like completely nullified us. Like our threat is that pace on the counter with them three, and it just I didn't didn't really work. I think Klaus is all right if you want to look another dimension, but our strongest team is with those three pacey players up top. I think, I think the, the issue was though he changed system though, didn't he? After Neto came off, he went with like a four four two rather than the five at the back. So it meant Huang was sitting a lot deeper and like Cunha was sitting a lot more central. Um, I don't. Know, I think I'd be inter- interested. Uh, Belgard obviously wasn't even fit enough to be part of the squad this weekend. So is he going to be ready to start a game this weekend? You know, and after what four, what, four or five weeks out uh, of the team, yeah, he's five weeks. Is he going to be able to come straight back in? So there's there's lots of options for Gary O'Neill. I think you could switch Cunha over to the wing and start Sasha or Fabio. Could you start Huang and uh, Cunha centrally and bring in Tommy Doyle, like George said, who I thought. Again, it was fantastic. I don't know if you, I think Roy ain't always just offside, but you see that outside of the foot pass right at the end of the game down the yeah. line. Fuck, it's just like the technique, it was unbelievable. Well, he should have used his left, mate, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or again, like George said, do you bring Sarabi back in? And, and it's hard because I think he does that, like you've said, Matt, lack that pace. But I think I would expect it to gain that we would dominate possession in, or at least, you know, sit in their final third quite a bit. And he has got that ability and quality to pick a pass and create a chance out of nothing. I know, so yeah. I, I know I know it sounds silly, but Tarabi is really good in tight spaces, almost playing in between lines. Tommy Dawes really good at finding players in those spaces. Could could something you know in in our wildest dreams something okay. like that happen? Because you see, like even against Newcastle, you can see Tommy Dore like slotting it in between players and and picking out passes. Someone that we've not, I think, um, even Neves didn't really do it. Dave, think think that could work? Possibly. I I, I very much doubt they both start the game together. Um, but they could definitely be on the pitch at the same time. You know, we saw it for a little bit at the end of the Bournemouth game. Could could happen again, but. The fact he brought Doyle on very, very quickly into that second half. And I think, like I said last week, in terms of pecking order now and priority of giving players minutes, Tommy Doyle's right up there. So he could start. It just really depends on what Gary O'Neill feels. You know, Sheffield United's threat is at the moment. They haven't got a lot. So, um, I don't know, maybe it's hard because in, in terms of attacking numbers, you are restricted a little bit with going at the back with the back five. Um, but it's just working. I don't think you can change that overall system, really. 
I think you look more of a threat with the back five. So I think I think what you could do if you went sort of central, you brought Tommy Doyle in for Neto, you just rely on Eight Nori and Samedo to create the, the, the space, you know. Mm. And Eight Nori's been playing, which was a left midfielder anyway. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be interesting, we'll see. What a game he had again, by the way, at the weekend. Superb. Mm. Um right, let's move on to the questions. So thank you for those who sent those in on Twitter. Um, Avro has asked, if refereeing decisions have gone our way this season, we'd be five points better off with nothing else changed, putting up it, us into sixth place on 17 points. How, re- how realistic do you think a top table uh, top table finishes this season? Could we get top eight? Mental, what a couple of wins and a couple of draws to sweet <laughs> confidence, isn't it? I still think we'll finish on 12th or 13th, Dave. You don't know, do you? I think obviously there's teams still in and around us at the moment. United, Chelsea, you would you would expect to improve quite drastically. Um I, I would take I think we're capable are we capable? Yes. And I think a good again, a good January window, we're very much capable of getting a top half finish. Top eight, I think, is a bit optimistic because then you're somehow you're expecting us to finish ahead of um uh, Newcastle, who I think we can go toe to toe with. You expect us to finish Newcastle, Villa, Brighton, you know, so that that's going to be a difficult uh, task. But if we can have a successful finish, it's laid down the foundations this season of something really, really nice. And hopefully we can kick on next year. George, where, where can Wolves finish? Can they get the top 10? I think we can get the top 10. I, I don't think it defines the season if we do or don't get in the top 10, though. I think um, no. for a ball was kicked, I think a lot of us, well, I, I certainly would have just taken 17th for them in a matter of like the, the toxicity around the club and, and what was going on, the carnage before a ball was kicked. Um, I think, you know, I think top 12 is realistic now, for sure. I think top top eight is probably pushing it. But again, I think we can beat any of these teams that you mentioned that Dave mentioned there on our day. I'm happy to go against them toe-to-toe. Um, it's just going to be that over over a thirty eight game season, whether we can withstand it and stuff. I think if Fosen back O'Neill in January and may bring in one or two more um, potentially, but I think we just got to you know we're in a good vein of form at the moment. Naturally, it will swing at some point. We might lose two or three on the bounce, and we just got to you know it'll even itself out a little bit. I think, but. Um, yeah, look, he's turned it around really well in the last sort of five, six weeks. Um, I think his stock is probably never been so high, especially after the Monday night football chat he had as well. And, mm-hmm. and you know, he's got a lot of time now with Wolves fans. And I think Wolves fans are bought in, fully bought into Gary O'Neill now, um, even those ones that weren't at the time um, and can understand why, you know, Matt Hobbs gave him the job when he interviewed because he's obviously a very articulate, articulate man and he's proven a lot of people wrong. Yeah, talks with his hands a lot, though, doesn't he? Just, <laughs> yeah. just, just gesticulates a lot. Um, <laughs> when was the last time, George, that you felt Wolves could go toe to toe with any top with any side? Um, probably the first first two years, of Nuno, I reckon. Yeah, the Europa the, League season, we could have beat anyone in the world, man. Anyone, across the yeah. That that season, yeah, we could have beat anyone for sure. Um, and then it all went to shit. I think I lost all faith and confidence as soon as we lost three two at home to the baggies. I think that was it then for me. Um, mm. And I, I haven't enjoyed following the club for for a long time, basically. Um, but you know what? I'm starting to you know starting to get that belief again now, and we're, we're playing some good football as well. So yeah, we actually are playing some good stuff. So it's good. It's it's nice to watch. Mm. Um, Matt Wolf has asked, does Gary O'Neill's need to start using more subs? Only three use in the last two matches. I know maybe the depth isn't quite there, but we're risking injuries and suspensions. I purely put that down to trust. I don't think he trusts off the bench, to be honest. Three, does, what, does he mean three different players using the last two matches? I think it just, just made eight? three changes rather than possibly five. Oh, the five? Yeah. I think he's, yeah, trust. I think sometimes, as long as he, you're confident the players are fit enough, to fill out the 90. I think, you know, if things are going well, why change it? Why do you need to change it? Mm. And obviously the Neto change was enforced on, on Saturday as well. But I always, I'm always, i always a little bit like, even when I used to coach, I felt like if a game's going well, even if you're not necessarily winning or the game, but you know you've got the momentum, it's yes, you can bring a player on and it will completely change the game. I think the forward line is one area that Wolves need to address. Obviously, we've got Kalajic and Fabio, but... No one has the quality on the ball 
a better quality on the ball than Cunyanet or Huang. So I think we do need either like an explosive winger or a really quick nippy winger that, you know, can play there. Enzo obviously isn't ready. I think if he was, he would be a great player to maybe, you know, put in there. Um, but I think it is, like you said, just trust and, and players that he knows at the moment can can play a system. I think he's found that with four good central midfielders now. Tommy Doyle offers something that the other guys can't. But Bubukar, Jao Gomez and Lamina have all proved that they can play there. Um, and same, same with the wing-backs in the back three. Santi Bueno obviously wasn't fit when he came. Obviously, isn't good enough. And, and, you know, the back three have every right to keep their place in the team. So, when you're unbeaten in five games, you can't just keep chopping and changing it for the sake of it. I think you've got to try and trust the players that are on the pitch. I I would have liked to have seen you said there about explosive wingers. Like, liked us to have gone and got another option like... Um... Like Sulemana at Southampton, obviously gone down. That's what someone mentioned him yesterday. Yeah, yeah, someone like that who like one v one is unbelievable. Might not have the the finished product, but it's just a, it's just another option, isn't there? Because I feel like now Neto's gone. I feel, I feel like we maybe a little bit e- like easier to play against, obviously, but a bit just a bit. I don't know. I just don't think he's going to work as well as he has done. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that, and that's why it'd be interesting. Belgard, I think he's in term if he's fit for Saturday, for Saturday, I think in terms of quality, he's got that on the ball. He's obviously not as explosive as Neto, but he's definitely quality. He can bring different players into play. He can beat a man. Um, so that's that's why it's going to be frustrating, but an interesting interest to see how Gary O'Neill copes with it. Mm. Next question is from Juicy Fruity. It says Gary O'Neill has already stated his concerns with squad this this season. Do you think Fosun will back him this summer? I think Fosun will back him this winter, to be honest. I think the January window. I'd assume that's what get... he meant, surely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, I, I can see him bringing like two or three players in. They're not going to be spending like 100 million, but Dave, I think that could be, you know, could be, could be, could be bringing those oh, players in. I think so as well. And I think, um, I don't know about you boys uh, in terms of positions, what you think, but I think a forward is probably going to be needed. I think players can leave. Fabio Silva, uh, I think, will be moved on, whether it be loan or permanent deal, more than likely a loan, I think, again. Um, but you're bringing another forward, uh, whether that's a wide player, but someone sort of similar to how you described, I think, an explosive winger, really. Um, he, he raised concerns about fullbacks as well. Johnny's obviously not up to it, um, so probably forced and try and move Johnny on. And if you can get someone that can play both sides to cover, uh, I think happy days, but I don't know about you, Jordan, in terms of positions where you'd look to bring in as well. Yeah, and no, I think I think that well, it's obvious now. Neto's gone down. We are a bit light in that that wide area. I think there's potentially. I mean, I was in the summer. I, you know, I thought we could have gone for someone like Somerville from Leeds. Um, we were interested in him back in the day before he went to Leeds. Yeah, like again, like non like the. the if you're looking at someone just to bring in for, for six months or whatever, there's people and they add a bit of quality. There's people like that, but again, they're on a promotion charge themselves. There might be something we can do with Fabio. Maybe I don't. I'm sure he's got his his sights on loftier uh, ambitions, but maybe maybe he needs six months in the championship. I don't know what what other people think about that. Maybe to sort of just prove himself in English football a little he'll bit. Go abroad. Um, he'll go abroad, and I don't think I think I think we'll sell him personally in January. I think we're gone. Um, same as Sarabi, I think he'll be gone. Um, yeah, fullback's an interesting one, obviously. Um, it, 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 for all of a sudden, you start, you start. I know, I know, we need more quality, but yeah, I'm actually quite content with the squad as well. Like, I actually feel like we've got options. We need more, and you can never have enough. But I don't, I, you know, I feel, I feel pretty comfortable at the moment. We, yeah, I think we need another centre half, but is that unfair on? Santi Bueno, who's come with a high reputation, we saw him unfit against Ipswich when we were poor. Um, you know, he's a Uruguayan international. He's obviously a player there. Um, yeah, look, you can never have enough quality. But I, I think the big, I think the big test will be around Christmas because you see, like the schedule. I think Gary O'Neill will start to learn a lot more. You're going to get you have, to have to give minutes to players that probably yeah, necessarily are. haven't got a lot of minutes. So by sort of mid to end of December. I think Matt Hobbs, Gary O'Neill are pretty much going to know who, where they need to bring players in for. Um, I think they'll already know, to be honest. So, but I think yeah. I think a big positive though for us, unlike other clubs, is we won't have many going to Afcon. Afcon's in January again, isn't it? Is that yeah. right? And it, it, I mean, they didn't qualify, did the Gabon? 
I don't think. No, so I think it'll I be eight, 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 I mean, just like Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think they're already up, already up players lined up. To be honest, um, and there's money to be spent as well. We know that it doesn't take a, 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 an accountant to work that out. Um, Christian has asked, do you do you like the fact that the refs and VAR get the crowd going like it did Saturday? Or do you think we should be able to generate our own atmosphere without it? To be honest, I thought the atmosphere was quite good from the get-go. Um, mm. I, the 5.30 kickoffs help and the late kickoffs because people have a few beers before town. But I don't know about you, lads, but I thought the atmosphere was good regardless. Yeah, it was good. I, I thought it was as well. There was obviously like the five, ten minutes after the penalty decision where there was obviously the chance about the Premier League and that being corrupt. But uh, other than that, I thought it was good. And I, I think you can just... You know what you watch the Juan goal back. I don't know if it's just me, but you listen Lean, to like so. you just listen to the the celebration. and think shit, like you know that I haven't heard us roll like back. for a long, long time. Yeah. There. No, back. you're yeah. you're right though. It was, it was sounded it wasn't as loud, but it was almost like Man United quarter final when Neto yeah. scored. Not Neto Jota, sorry. The best um, it, when when they got like watched it back, you know, just as he hit, the ball hits him, you go from really loud to almost silent within like yeah, a millisecond, and then it just erupts again. Like, <laughs> you talk yeah, the, but... oh, 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 yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. absolutely super Plus. career path game, lads. Come you've on, you've had a bit of time off to practice, George. That's an that's where you've been. Um, <laughs> I've been in the without your exploits in Amsterdam, which we won't go into. Um, <laughs> Do you need reminded with the rules? Or right. no, let's go. are you happy to crack on? Let's go. You both ready? Yeah. I think so. Player number one started his career at Lorient 2 in 2010 um, and then moved to Lorient first team in 2012 until 2013. He then moved to Marseille B team in 2013 before making his professional uh, making his debut at Marseille in 2013. Um, in 2015, he moved to Juventus. He played 29 games. Mario Lamina. Oh, Dave was there first. Sorry, George. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's the lad. Dave was there first. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sorry, George. <laughs> <laughs> the lag. <laughs> you know, you misplay the pass on pro clubs. Yeah, oh, I'm lagging. I'm lagging. I'm lagging. I'm lagging. <laughs> Ready for player two. Got them. This player started his career at Aston Villa in 1991, where he made 52 appearances. During his spell at Aston Villa, he went on loan to Bromsgrove Rovers, Gloucester City 92-93, Scarborough 93-94, and Tranmere Rovers in 1994. In 1999, he made the switch across the Midlands to Wolverhampton Wanderers, where he played 199 oh, games. Michael Oakes. Michael oh, Oakes. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Get in. George, mate, I put that in one. I put that one in for you because that was your well, era. That was like way before my time. Why, yeah. Great mm. goalkeeper. He got done dirty in the 03 season when Paul Jones came in. He was crap. <laughs> <laughs> he did all right. Six months, mate. He what, mate? He did all right when Matt Murray went down. To be fair, mm. the, then they brought in bloody big Paul Jones, and that was it. Big Paul Jones. Player number three. You're going to have to be quick on this one, guys. Okay? Looks like. <laughs> George, I'm going to give you a bit of notice. <laughs> on. This player started his career at Wolverhampton Wanderers in 2000, making 212 appearances, scoring 13 goals. He then left the club in 2006, where he joined Everton. Jolene making... Lescott. <laughs> Jolene Lescott. I had a feeling it was going to be Lescott. Yeah, George, that. you're half asleep here, mate. I didn't realise he scored that many goals for us, to be fair. Yeah, he, mate, he scored goals everywhere he's gone. Got I know, 14 yeah. from Everton. <laughs> Bags, man. Um, I remember him scoring in Euro 2000 and... Was it 2008 when he scored against France? Yeah. The Brew. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. We did that event with you, didn't we, Dave? Yeah. He ignored Dave. Did he? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was, I was mid-conversation with him and he just started there uh, going... Just started voice notes on WhatsApp. <laughs> well, I, was down. Well, I was doing a podcast and just started voice noting halfway through. I was like, oh, that's sad. Yeah. Uh, he didn't want to be there, did he? No, bless him. 
to be fair, when we did the actual um, event, he was sound. Like, he was really good value. But uh, backstage, he couldn't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I don't blame him. Ready for player four? Yep. I don't know, it's getting embarrassing. It is. This is embarrassing. <laughs> this this player started his career at Christchurch in 1992, where he made zero appearances before leaving for Cambridge United. In Kevin 19- Muscat? No. George, Bro, got, here we go. Here you're we go. all right. You're no! Right. Shut up, Dave. There you go. <laughs> in 1993, he joined Cambridge United, making 145 appearances, scoring four goals. During his time at Cambridge, he went on loan to Woking before signing permanently for Sunderland in 1997, where he made 146 appearances, scoring two well. goals. I know it is. During that time, he went on loan to Sheffield United in 1999 before moving to Wolves permanently in 2003. He made 215 appearances for Wolves, scoring 14 goals. During his time at Wolves, he went on loan to Stoke City in 2007, making four appearances, um, and then he retired at Wolves. Jody Craddock. Jody Craddock, well done, mate. Clawed back a bit of pride. I was just making sure then. <laughs> I was letting it go all the way through. I thought, right, I'm going to listen to the whole career first. Yeah. Sorry when you said this. Christchurch, Day, did you think Australia? Not Australia. I think it's in New, New Zealand. Zealand. So that's why it's yeah, even it's, more yeah, yes, It's in Dorset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Final player. This one, it, this bloke's had more clubs than a golfer, so let me have a swig of water. <laughs> <laughs> Player five started his career at St Mirren in 1995, where he made 31 appearances, scoring one goal before moving to Eros Fremad in 1998, where he stayed there for two years. He scored four goals in 27 appearances. He then made the glamorous move to Stoke City in 2000, um, where he stayed there for four years, making 84 appearances, scoring 15 goals. During his time at Stoke, he went on loan to York, Cheltenham Town, Brighton and Harve Albion. In 2004, he joined Alemannia Aachen, where he he made nine appearances, scoring zero goals, before making the move to Colchester United in 2005. Chris Iwalumo. Chris Iwalumo. It's Chris Iwalumo. Wow, I'm only about a quarter of the way through his clubs. <laughs> St. Mirren, oh, Aaron no. Street, Stoke City, York City, Cheltenham Town, Brighton, Alamin and Aachen, Colchester United, Charlton Athletic, Wolverhampton Wonders, Bristol City, Burnley, Watford, Notts County, Oldham Athletic, Scunthorpe United, St. Johnston, Chester. Remember his beast for Scotland? Yeah, that's what I yeah. Remember when he yeah. lasted 24 hours in the Wolves job? I remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah, he came as a coach, yeah. didn't he? Twenty no, under twenty ones manager, and then t- the day last. I don't know he did that. Yeah, like, he left. Like January twenty four hours. He preferred to do the old gold club with Mike yeah. Morris. <laughs> he must have like done the interview on Zoom and then travelled into work on the first saying, "Thought fucking hell, she's far." Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit of an odd one, Dave. If you want more updating the scores for me, please, just that'd be it. fantastic. I've just, I've just done it. You've uh, you're, you're flying away with this, aren't you, Dave? I need to start making it a little bit tougher. I need players from like the sixties. Give Jordan up hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, to be fair, I should have got the Jody. I would have got the Jody credit one early if I'd uh, if I hadn't jumped in. But yeah, I'm doing all right at the minute. Well done, mate, Jordan. Well done on getting the Jody credit one. Well, I'm taking a three-two. It's not bad. And I'm Finn and Jordan think... on the same score, roughly at the moment. Well, that, we... I'm not taking that though. Yeah, well, I've said I've got three. I've got more than three, haven't I? No, you got six. no, no. You got. I mean, you got six, but you played oh, double the game. You played four games. Vin's only played two. And got if we're doing it on a points per, uh, points points per, per game, game basis. basis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Finn's under the thumb, isn't he? That's why he don't come on here. Same with you, eyes. I'm here. Should have knocked at the door. How long are you gonna fucking be on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we better um, better let you get back, mate. I know you're trying to sort things out after Amsterdam and the old debacle with a, <laughs> the glizzy goblin. <laughs> um, <laughs> George, where could people find you? Should they wish to follow you? Oh, um, one second, Dave. You've got an announcement. Sleep out. Oh yeah, sorry. Got about yeah, this. I was gonna say anyway. Yeah, um, it's just over two weeks now to the Molyneux Sleep Out. We will get the guys on uh, from the Walls Foundation on the podcast at some point in the next week or so. Um, but if any, is anyone wants to contribute towards our fundraising page, I'll make sure I leave a link in the top of the description. If it's a couple of quid or five, obviously it all goes a really long way. So yeah, anything you can do to help, thank you. Yeah, um, I won't be. I won't be doing it. But Jordy, are you doing it? I'm on holiday. 
Again? What was it? Yeah, I'm in uh, Malvern this year for the weekend. In a Malvern? Malvern, yeah. You, sorry, you're going on holiday to Malvern? Well, say I'm a holiday. I'm on a... I'm going... Where's that like Essex way? Malvern? <laughs> it's Worcester. Worcester. Uh, Worcester. Oh, I'm thinking that there's another Malvern. I'm thinking of that. In the Mal- Malvern Hills? Here we Malvern. Oh, never, never heard Hard that. work, that. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm there, I'm there for the, for like a long weekend um, in like a log cabin. So nice, yeah. nice. I'm uh, I will be donating. It's obviously a fantastic cause. Um, After his bet, I feel, like, like, feel like I feel like I'm avoiding it because I missed it last year as well. But uh, I'll definitely will be there next year. I'm going to put it in my calendar when we get there. I think we were quite um, lucky with the weather last year because even though it was like fairly late in the year it was still quite warm considering weren't it Dave yeah, it wasn't too bad yeah I actually got some sleep until people just laughing and talking well loud at like four in the morning I was like Gary Pound and snoring yeah that was bad oh <laughs> <laughs> you messaged me yesterday saying hey, can he stick with us I was like yeah sound as long as you don't sleep by me that's sound mate so he's funny man yeah. yeah, had a good time last night. Hopefully, uh, last time. Hopefully, um, get some more donations in for you, Dave. I've already donated. I've, I've done Thank my you. bit, especially Thank if I'm, I'm not there. Um, but yeah, George, where can people find you? Match with Dave. We're sorry for cutting you off. I know it was a very that's important. Message. No, that's more. That's more far more important than uh, where to find me. Um, so yeah, George was seven at Twitter and Instagram. Dave, where can people find you? Should they wish? At Dave has a party on YouTube. Not Tinder, YouTube. Inge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dave's party on Twitter, <laughs> Instagram, and Twitch as well. I've been playing a lot of Football Manager, so if you want to come watch me on Twitch, then yeah, feel free to do so. Bumble as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot about Bumble. Plenty of fish. Grinder, yeah, all of them. <laughs> hey. How are you getting on with the streaming, mate? I saw that you qualified for the Champions League. Oh, mate, I almost saw Messi today as well. I try, I've been trying to get rid of Geddes and Pedence all summer, and no one wants them, and I need 10 million on deadline day to sign Messi and I couldn't get it and it fell through. You need the in-game editor, that's what you need. Uh, so it's not out yet. So. Is it not? No, it only comes out when the full game's out. So. Oh, you're an FM purist as well, aren't you? I bet you'd yeah. never touch that. No, nah, never, mate. Never, never. Never. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when do you reckon you're going to get the job at Wolves doing the FM videos, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Banda. <laughs> uh, they stopped doing them, haven't they? Yeah, it was only an experiment, apparently. So, we were met by a lot of backlash from the, the Twitter army. Um, why isn't that time doing that? Because he's shit. That's why he uses the in-game editor. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Cooper bites on Twitter and M Cooper writes. We are talking wolves across all socials. Don't forget to follow Green King Sport on Instagram as well. You'll be doing us a huge favour. Um, yeah, if you've enjoyed it, let us know in the, 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 the comments down below. Like the video. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It means the world to us. And yeah, hopefully, um, the lads, I won't be here, but we'll be discussing uh, a massive three points on the road at Bram- Bramall Lane. Hopefully, Finn will be back for that one as well and come out of hiding. We don't know where he is. Um, come out from not, under, not, yeah. Under, yeah, come out from <laughs> under the thumb. If George can do it, so can Finn. But until next time, <laughs> take care. See you later.